Michelle, Michelle Hai, Managing Editor, American Purpose. Thank you for getting us together, admitting us to the Zoom room. Great to see everybody today. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. We have an hour today till 3 p.m. Eastern with an extraordinary writer and scholar and thinker. That's John Rodden, who last year published this book. Uh, I'm better at holding up in person than I am in Zoom, but that's the book. The book is Princeton University Press 2000, uh, 2020, Becoming George Orwell, Life and Letters, Legend, Legacy. Uh, when we invited John to do this discussion with us some weeks ago, uh, we wanted to talk about the book. We wanted to talk about George Orwell, who is forever interesting to everybody in this gallery. Um, I must confess, I had in mind talking about the book in the context of free speech issues today in the United States. And of course, now the lens widens, I suppose, with the war in Ukraine and the crackdown in Vladimir Putin's Russia, which already shows signs of becoming exceptionally severe. We'll see where the conversation goes. You will have ample time to offer your comments and ask questions. John, welcome. Thank you very much. Congratulations on this fine book. If you haven't read it, I commend it. It's a terrific read. Just to get us going, I have two, maybe three and a half questions, um, if you all don't mind. John, it's always useful to me anyway to hear from an author about what led to this, this piece of research and this writing and this book. Could you give us a little background about why Becoming George Orwell and why at this time? I have been fascinated not only with George Orwell for more than four decades and written about him since the early 1980s, but also with the legacy of George Orwell. And this book is really the culmination of 40 years of reflection on the relation between these two. What I'm referring to as Orwell, namely the man and the author, and Orwell in inverted quote marks. In fact, you have to imagine screaming italics that is a big brotherish figure that is associated with his proper adjective Orwellian. And this is the posthumous Orwell. This is the figure with whom people conjure. And ever since his death in January, 1950, it is this figure who has expanded and loomed larger and larger and larger on the international scene. And this is a kind of Dr. Frankenstein Frankenstein relationship. That is, there are tens, if not hundreds of millions of people who are vaguely familiar with this Orwell, bogeyman figure, who have no knowledge whatsoever of the man, George Orwell, or the writer and literary figure and often confuse or conflate the two. And so Becoming George Orwell, the title of my newest book, is meant to be more subtle than can be just directly reflected by the title itself. That is, it is Eric Blair, his original name, becoming in the aftermath of his participation as a militiaman in the Spanish Civil War and writing Animal Farm in 1984, becoming George Orwell, the literary figure, and then becoming George, quote unquote, Orwell, posthumously, the bogeyman, the big brotherish, legendary icon with whom the right and the left across the political spectrum have conjured for the last 70 years. John, in undertaking the, the research for the book, could you say 
a little bit about connective thread that emerged. Could you say a little bit about whether you encountered surprises, things that you caught, caught you off guard as you dug into the subject matter? Yes. What, what has continually surprised and impressed me are what I would describe as the scenes from an afterlife. That is, you may recall that F. Scott Fitzgerald made the famous remark, there are no second acts in American literature. And I would say that, uh, generally speaking, that's been true. <laughs> uh, uh, but if we want to qualify that and speak of British literature or just speak of this unique case of Orwell, the second act has been far, far greater and more impressive, if terrifying, than the first act. Uh, and this has continually impressed and surprised me, the new scenes, so to speak, the new topics into which George Orwell directly inserts himself. So for instance, even now, today, this very day, you can discover online dozens, if not hundreds of hits in multiple languages speculating if Orwell were alive today, what would he say about the invasion of Ukraine and the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin? And these are questions that have been asked continuously if Orwell were alive today. In fact, it is such a remarkable phenomenon, especially among intellectuals and fellow writers, that I once dubbed this process as a kind of uh, play off the evangelical community, WWGOD. Not what would Jesus do, WWJD, but what would George Orwell do <laughs> and say? Uh, Korea, Vietnam, all the way up through 21st century. That is long after the man's conceivable lifespan, these questions are still being asked. And what surprises and impresses me is George Orwell is more alive today in the sense of being part of continuous international debate than most of us who are living and attending this session today. John, thank you. Um, I wanna ask about two, I'm picking now two chapters and then we will open it up. Uh, the one chapter, um, they're all intriguing. The one chapter which I enjoyed very much is titled Catholic Exceptionalism, Why Catholic America Canonized St. George. And let me read a passage uh, from your book, John, in which you write that the Trotskyists would embrace Orwell as understandable, but it is more difficult to explain his appeal to American Catholics Besides his well-known contempt for religion in general and Catholicism in particular, Orwell considered Catholicism's political tendency plainly fascist. Tell us something about this chapter and this observation. It is surprising on the face of it uh, and in a sense, it says a lot for both sides that a certain form of rapprochement did develop and was chiefly initiated by liberal Catholics, above all in the United States. That is, how and why did Catholics embrace George Orwell? Defying the hierarchy and the Vatican, American liberal Catholics, above all associated with Commonweal, that is a liberal weekly at the time in the 1930s, run by laymen, 
Catholic intellectuals began to admire what they regarded as Orwell's extraordinary intellectual integrity. And they decided that they would either overlook or downplay or simply seek a bridge with what they found to be their shared convictions. Now, remember, this is the context of the Spanish Civil War, and this is regarded as a holy war on the part of most American Catholics even, but certainly the official view of the Vatican. Franco had been murdering, excuse me, uh, the loyalists for whom Orwell fought had been murdering priests, raping nuns, desecrating churches. That is what was publicized in most Catholic communities. And Orwell stood firmly on the side of the loyalists. But American Catholics, Catholic intellectuals in particular associated with Commonwealth saw this in a much more complex light. Uh, that is, they also saw uh, what Franco and the fascists were doing in Spain, uh, what, what their evils were. Uh, and they did not see some rapprochement with Orwell as a bridge too far. So essentially what happened was that this was a foretaste of Vatican II. In a sense, the uh, detente that emerged between Orwell and liberal American Catholics in America uh, was a move outward by the Catholic Church toward embracing the wider world and seeing Orwell as a religious fellow traveler. What Chesterton referred to as a good agnostic. And Chesterton was one of George Orwell's favorite boyhood authors. And he did not see or Chesterton's Catholicism, he was a Catholic convert in fact, as some kind of insuperable impediment to an admiration for his work. That's exactly the standard that American Catholics, uh, Catholic intellectuals, of this sort applied to Orwell himself. John, thank you. One more on my side before we open it up. I'm turning back to the book, chapter 12, a title, Why I Am Not a Socialist. And I'm reading from your book, John. You say, I thank my readers for allowing me to indulge in this personal turn. You say, as a young man, I embraced a radical politics and utopian aspirations. Tell us about this chapter, and we should hear more about George Orwell, but you as the investigator. For many years at the University of Virginia, University of Texas and elsewhere, I taught a course in the history of the utopian imagination. Uh, and we culminated with John Lennon's Imagine. <laughs> and uh, it somewhat reflected a certain ethos of the 60s as I now look, look through it as far as the framework and the lens of my attitude toward the tradition. And I certainly still greatly profit from that tradition and see myself building on it and indebted to it. But as time went by, I began to ask myself two questions. One is, if indeed George Orwell were alive today, then what would he have said about the course of the left and the prospects for socialism after his death in 1950? Remember, it was only in October 1949 that the second socialist state in the world had even been founded, the People's Republic of China. So that the only experience that George Orwell ever had of socialism was the union of Soviet socialist republics, which of course he insisted had done dirt on socialism, that the USSR was no more socialist than national socialism under Hitler. And that's partly why he wrote Animal Farm in 1984. And he believed that the danger was that that kind of state socialism could spread anywhere. Hence the name of the party in 1984, Ingsoc, 
English socialism. But what if he had lived and saw that so many of the other socialist states of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond had turned out to be little brothers. It was still possible, easily possible in 1950, to say that Stalinism, and remember Joseph Stalin was still in power, was not socialism. And that democratic socialism was something that still needed to be fought for as a third way. It became less and less possible when each socialist state began to replicate, even if on the little brother level, some of the evils. That's on the one side. And the other side, I began to ask myself, is human nature perhaps not quite ready for what Orwell thought the essence of socialism, which was not a progressive agenda, but simply the complete and wholehearted commitment to justice and liberty. And that's why I began to downscale and say, if you project aspirations for human beings that are beyond their capacities, you very often introduce disillusion and frustration and hypocrisy and even revolution that is counter-revolution. So in downsizing and saying, let us proceed from the ground up step by step, I became a social democrat. I moved slightly ever rightward toward the center and said that we will have to take a slower approach, whatever the injustice is in the short run, in order to ensure that freedom be maintained even as we seek justice, that is equality. And this was, of course, Orwell's worry too. He wrote a very flattering review of Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, where he pointed out that socialism, so far as that economic analysis had led him to believe at the time, did indeed run the danger of some kind of very dark future. So uh, on both those roads, I began to look and say, I am not a socialist. Why? Because history seems to have spoken and the capacities of human beings in their willingness to go beyond their present level of mental, spiritual capacity for sharing also seem to have spoken. Let's downscale and move on from a more modest set of aspirations. That's why I'm not a socialist. John, thank you. I want to open to questions and comments from the gallery. Feel free to put your question in chat if you like. Keep an eye on what Michelle, my colleagues, put in chat, John, and articles he's written for us for American Purpose. Uh, if you want to use the raised hand function, press the button. And if I miss you, just wave through the screen or Michelle will alert me. But the floor is open. Who would like to be first? Uh, I see Fritz Heinzen to everyone, and you are all welcome to read that, but Fritz, would you like to have the floor? You, you need to unmute. Uh, okay, very good. I happened to see a movie last night, made quite an impression. Um, the movie uh, is uh, Mr. Jones, and it's about Gareth Jones and his efforts to publicize uh, just the incredible brutality and, and starvation of the holodomer. And it, it was interesting how in this movie, George Orwell is always there in the background, the beginning of the movie, at the end of the movie, and he's typing Animal Farm, and they have him meet Gareth Jones at one point for conversation. So 
If you've seen the movie, I'd love to know what you think of how they worked or, or well into it as, as, as a constant theme throughout it. I thought it was a very intriguing move uh, by, the, by the filmmakers, but you as the uh, Orwell expert, what did you think? If you've seen it, have you seen it? No, I have not. And okay. so I should really be asking you, uh, I have been asked by a couple of other people this very question. And I do know that they played a bit fast and loose with Animal Farm and, and George Orwell, but I haven't actually seen the movie myself yet. It's on Hulu. It's readily available. And I, I, I thought it was very clever. Now, yes, I, and I don't fully know how much changing of the narrative of Orwell there was, or of the writing of Animal Farm, but how it so clearly makes the point. In fact, the film even opens up with pigs uh, groveling in the dirt. Um, and then you have Orwell typing and, and reading sections of his work as he's typing and so on. Um, I think the movie, for, for those who are often maybe stumped as to where does Ukrainian resistance to Russia come from, uh, watching this movie might be a, just sort of a good introduction as to, as to why there's a hatred uh, for Russia or for communism or, or Putin's notion that communism should be brought back. All right, I don't want to take over in, in, in all of this discussion. So let me throw that out there. Hulu has it. Take a look if you've seen it. And, um, you know, yes. much success with I, your I, book. Your book sounds intriguing. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, as, as to your question and comment, I do have the impression that the filmmakers shrewdly realized that, to coin a, a pun, they, they could piggyback on the fame of Animal Farm and make this a much more accessible, powerful film. And so I, I, I congratulate them on that, but there's definitely a lot of artistic license as far as I could determine from a couple of conversations I had with friends, so I have not seen it yet. Thank you. Thank you, Fritz. Floor is open, who would like to be next? Michelle, who do you see? I see Joe with his hand up and then Kate Epstein. Oh, well, there we are, Joe, and then Kate in that order. All right. Um, thank you so much for this talk, uh, Mr. Rodden. Uh, I guess I have a question. I'm sort of a joy, I'm an Orwell novice. I've only read 1984 and Animal Farm, um, one of the high school books, I guess. Uh, so I might be mis mistaken. But in reading 1984, I feel that um, two points have sort of become outdated about the book. Uh, one, that uh, authoritarian countries have gotten a lot more subtle with their repression. Um, no longer are there the mass Stalinist executions um, in, in most states anymore. Rather, the even the Soviet Union persecution became more subtle, more about um, denying promotions or denying opportunities to go to uh, college. Um, rather than say carting you off to a, a gulag. Um, and then I guess the, the second thing is that um, the idea that a central bureaucracy would be able to control all flows of information also seems quite out of date. Uh, if anything, the big concerns about misinformation aren't um, centralized, aren't from a central source, but basically a wide variety of competing sources that overloads the um, that overloads everything and no one really knows what's true. Would you say that these are outdated or would you say that Orwell actually perhaps had predicted, predicted these? Um... That is an excellent question. And it's actually a live debate among scholars in different intellectual communities and academic subfields. And it directly relates to the key image that has emerged from the history of reception of 1984, namely George Orwell, the prophet. To what extent was he a prophet? From one angle of argument, you see, 1984 led to 1989. That is, Orwell, the prophet, was so overwhelmingly powerful 
that is, as a cautionary prophet, that the warning succeeded and 1984 toppled tyrannical socialism, witnessed the Berlin Wall in November 1989 and the collapse of the USSR itself in 1991. And so Yes, we no longer have the world of Oceania that Orwell depicted precisely because that world was so terrifyingly powerful in its presentation in his anti-utopia that it served as a key cultural and literary salvo that destroyed that prophetic possibility. That's one possibility. Uh, in the late 1970s and 1980s, the Futurologist magazine, which was really the flagship organ of an entire community, interdisciplinary community within the academy and beyond of futurologists operating in a number of different fields in the social sciences, actually went through the book line by line and came up with more than 100 predictions that they said were embedded in George Orwell's anti-utopia. And then they tried to link conditions of the 1970s and 80s with the precise description in the novel, namely, was this prediction born out in 1980, 1985, and so on? So on the eve of 1984, the year, futurologists from a number of different fields were doing exactly the sort of thing that we're talking about. Now, of course, what this completely ignores is that Orwell never sought to be a prophet, let alone some kind of prognostician that was launching predictions of what the world would be like. This was indeed a warning. It was a warning against totalitarianism. He made this quite explicit, in fact, in a statement that was issued within a week of its publication in America, because already at that time, the book was being taken simply as a direct attack on socialism in all its guises, namely including democratic socialism. And he called himself a democratic socialist. So in a sense, he's being asked to fulfill a task that he never set himself insofar as people would say, well, this isn't really accurate as to how the world has turned out. <laughs> so. The first argument is, well, that's because it was such a success. The second argument is, well, that's not be, uh, having anything to do with the aspirations of the book. He wasn't trying to do that. Uh, and there's a third aspect here that I think also relates to the, the climate that you're asking. Uh, a vigorous debate has gone on between the advocates of George Orwell and those of his teacher at Eton, Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World, as to whose vision is the most accurate. If you look at Huxley, remember that his world, his Brave New World, is set in the year 632 AF, after Ford. That is, it's set in the 26th century. And Basically, Huxley's view is that the tyrants of the future will be so clever that they will simply make us love our slavery. So whether it's drugs or whatever other indulgences, in Brave New World, as you'll remember, it's Soma, <laughs> which of course has a somatic effect. It turns you into a kind of zombie. Uh, and certainly there are plenty of spokesmen for the Huxley side that say that is a much more accurate 
This is soft, soft tyranny. Orwell's talking about hard, brutal tyranny. Uh, those who favor Orwell, though, say that the scenes between O'Brien and Winston Smith in Room 101, the torture scenes, which are, of course, his own updating and rendition of the scenes of the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's The Brothers of Karamazov, reflect the deepest reality, namely power, hunger, leader, worship, the cult of personality, that sadomasochistic relationship is at the basis of everything. So yes, we will go soft if that's all we need to do. But the naked fist of power is behind everything else and will be applied when needed. And that that was the lesson that the totalitarians of Oceania in Emmanuel Goldstein's manual, The Theory of Oligarchical Collectivism, <laughs> uh, said, this is what we learned from Hitler and Stalin. As O'Brien says to Winston in Room 101, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. When things get down to brass tacks, that's what we'll do. We'll take the gloves off. Maybe you could argue that that's what Vladimir Putin has adopted as his own political philosophy. So I'm not trying to defend George Orwell's vision nor Aldous Huxley's, but just point to, yes, overtly, what you're describing is true. Certainly in the West, at least, we don't have the same kind of torture rack that we did, so to speak, in the days of the mid 20th century. What we have is something much more subtle, but what lies behind it? Oxley, Huxley would say, no, we're moving in the direction and the West certainly reflects this, even if maybe the East is not yet, of ruling everybody by a much softer approach. And that's what big tech and the multinationals all realize as well. We don't have to do any of that. We can just make them love their servitude. They'll just be slaves, unconscious ones, as in uh, Brave New World. They'll all be deltas and epsilons. We only need a few alphas. So, John, thank you. Before I go on, I should have done this earlier, forgive me, but could I ask people to identify themselves and Joe, thank you. And Joe, would you say who you are? Identify yourself, please. Oh, hi, I'm Joe. Um, I'm just a software engineer uh, on the West Coast. I'm just uh, interested in sort of classical liberalism and uh, um, political theory. So this is very interesting. This is a really great answer. Thank you so much. So Joe, thank you for being with us. And don't say, I'm just a software engineer. Thanks for being with us, Joe. Great question. Kate, tell us who you are and then pose your question or make your comment. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so uh, I'm, my name is Kate Epstein. I'm a historian. Um, I've also written a bit for American Purpose. And um, I don't want to say how much of an Orwell novice I am, uh, to borrow Joe's phrase, because it's kind of embarrassing. Um, but um, I actually had a question about um, uh, an essay by Orwell uh, called Reflections on Gandhi, um, which is an essay that I, I teach actually. And um, one of the questions that Orwell wrestles with that uh, with in that essay is um, uh, the relationship between greatness and goodness. Um, and you know he talks about how, Gandhi, you know, however admirable he may have been on kind of the ma a macro level, um, and he has some things to, some questions about even that, um, that he was kind of a jerk to his wife um, and his kids. And um, 
and I'm sorry for the banging in the background. Uh, we're having a bit of construction done. Um, and so I just wondered kind of like how Orwell, more, more broadly than in that, this, this essay, how he thought about the relationship between kind of trying to be a decent person in your personal private life and then kind of how you act um, on the public stage. That's such an excellent and important question. Well, certainly uh, much of the criticism that he had of political figures and fellow intellectuals on the left had to do with hypocrisy and the cruel double standards that they imposed, which is not to say that he was in any stretch of the imagination perfect in his own way. Let me just turn for a moment to the essay because if you recall, he wrote that in January, 1949, less than a year before he died. And he marvels at how well Gandhi managed to remain a moral exemplar. The last line remember is, how clean a smell he manages to leave behind. And if you remember Orwell and Road to Wigan Pier, <laughs> smell was his most sensitive uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the senses, um, the working class's smell. <laughs> he didn't mean that in any kind of uh, pejorative sense. He meant that as a descriptive sense for a middle-class Englishman like himself, it was a confession. Uh, so, how difficult it was, I guess, as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre would be just saying, not to get dirty hands. Uh, and I would say that seems to be the best that Orwell thought you could do. Uh, rather than become filthy from head to toe, like most political intellectuals and certainly political figures would tend to do, uh, if you got involved in politics, you were going to get dirty hands. And I think a guide to what he saw as necessary was his little essay, Why I Write, which was published in 1946, just a few months after Animal Farm. And in that essay, he says, I have four great motives for writing. And, and I think, in an age like this, and he wrote a little poem where he says, I wasn't born for an age like this, which he means this dark political age in which not to get involved in politics and the fight for social justice strikes him as not just a form of passivity and quietism, but as a veiled surrender to and even alliance with injustice, the forces of darkness. So he says the first, which was the primary one for him, sheer egoism. He says that's the great motive for most of us, either in this lifetime to get the headlines or to be remembered after death. The second aesthetic enthusiasm, the joy of mere words, as he called it, and how much he loved that since he was a boy. And he says that at the age of five, he wrote a little poem that he says, I didn't realize I was plagiarizing Blake because it was about a tiger. And the third was a duty to history. And that above all, he says, was my goal in homage to Catalonia. And possibly I ruined the damn book because Instead of just writing a book of personal witness and what I saw and what I thought were the ethical and moral issues, I tried chapter and verse to prove my case. And so I quoted all the misrepresentations in Kingsley Martin's New Statesman and all the distortions in the press. And so I larded the book with all of this journalistic stuff that future readers may not be interested in, in the service of what I regarded as establishing the historical truth 
This is what they said. These are the lies that I'm showing you. And then the fourth, and he said, this is the most important today, political purpose. And in an age like this, as much as I would not want to do it, you have to write for the age and not just for the ages. You see, remember that he's writing at a time of high modernism. The world of the Victorian and Edwardian writers, the loose baggy monster novels that Henry James had condemned has been superseded by James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Wells, Bennett, Galsworthy, all of the predecessors, even Dickens have been denigrated as something of the past. So Orwell is not writing modernist novels with stream of consciousness and techniques and so on. Instead, he says, no, no, I am facing the fact that I'm sacrificing the possibility of my works living beyond their historical moment by committing myself to a political purpose. After the 1930s, he no longer even attempts to write a realistic novel. He changes the very genre. He writes a beast fable in Animal Farm that is a political allegory of the Soviet revolution. And then he writes an anti-utopia. So uh, in the broadest sense, see, I think this all relates to what he sees as the relationship between literature and life and the ethical obligations that one has in one's profession and in one's daily life. I will say this, however, that uh, he has been severely criticized on two grounds, one of which I think is unfair and the other certainly in this day and age, uh, fair or at least deserves a very, very close and strong hearing. The first is uh, from the Marxist left as to whether or not by sharing a list of suspected politically unreliable writers and intellectuals in Britain and America, that he had somehow, uh, and turned these into the IRD, the uh, Information Research Department, which was the newly founded uh, FBI CIA of Britain, that he had somehow been a snitch, Orwell the snitch, Orwell telling on these other writers. Uh, but I think it's important to note that the only uh, point of is keeping his list and turning it in was that they were asking him who would be uh, very suitable to promote a, a Western view. And Orwell had just had the experience of both Animal Farm and 1984 being uh, rejected by publishers that had been influenced on the inside by editors who were secretly members of the Communist Party. On the second side, did he live up to his own ideals uh, in his interpersonal relationships? In particular, let's say his uh, relationships with women? Arguably, no, by today's standards. But to say he was anti-woman, I think is completely inaccurate. He was anti-feminist, that's true. Um, he had multiple affairs, so did his wife Eileen have at least uh, two affairs. Uh, it was a different world. Uh, by today's standards, he certainly fell short in a number of ways uh, in his romantic relationships, let's say, or in his personal life. All that has to do, of course, with personal ethics as well. So uh, I think this is very complex, but I'm just meaning to kind of sketch the issues that are involved in answering this both in a professional and in a personal context. So, Tom Kay, thank you very much. Well, we, we have 15 minutes remaining. There are two questions in chat, uh, Brooks Spector and Roy Bella. I wonder if Brooks, in both of your cases, but Brooks, you first, would you like to speak, give voice to your question? I'll be happy to read it, but I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, why don't you just go ahead and read it, uh, because I, I, I don't think I want to add other than just to say a, 
I'm not an academic per se. I, I've, I've done some university teaching. I'm a retired foreign service living in South Africa, but something of an Orwell fan probably since high school and have, have everything I can purchase that's in print except for the entire major collected uh, letters, essays, and the four volumes set, yes, is well thumbed. But if you'll just read my question, I think that's probably straightforward. So, so uh, I'm scrolling back to it. I'm not going to read it in its entirety. It's a little bit long, but everybody can see it and everybody can read it. And it's in reference to an essay titled You and the Atomic Bomb, written just after World War II. And when, when one scrolls down, forgive my, my succinct version, uh, is this in some fashion, John, a guide for today? That is another interesting speculative question. And here again, these are the sorts of conjectures that arise in Orwell's case and in practically no other. This just really needs to be emphasized that uh, this is quite rare, uh, quite, quite rare. And it's another example of how relevant Orwell is to the present and how in a sense that he is more contemporary than even our contemporaries. <laughs> uh, that is, many of us are writers and no one asks a month from now, <laughs> well, so-and-so wrote that, I wonder if that's still relevant in 2023. <laughs> uh, whereas you and the atom bomb, a little essay that Orwell wrote in 1945, just in the aftermath, of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, is still being raised as to whether or not it is pertinent to present day circumstances. Now, in the broadest sense, it's certainly pertinent. That is, Orwell says in the essay that we have to find some way of coming to terms with our differences globally, that we simply will not have recourse even to imagining the use of these kinds of weapons as part of international relations. He acknowledges that the genie is out of the genie bar. Yeah. Uh, that you, you can't go back. We know what we know. Uh, but remember at this time, the US is the only nation that has it. Uh, and it's in a sense also a call upon the USA to unilaterally forego, renounce these weapons. Now that, might have seemed a bit utopian, uh, even Pollyannish um, uh, in hindsight. But I think strategically Orwell was also attempting to appeal beyond the British scene uh, and to call on what he thought of as the ideals of the democratic left with whom he was affiliated in the USA. Remember he was the London correspondent for partisan review, which was the leading intellectual organ in the middle decades of the 20th century in the USA. So um, when it's important just to keep in mind the audience here. Um, now, on the other side, I think you could say in 2022 that much of what that essay specifically says is outmoded or has been superseded insofar as I don't think Orwell uh, really imagine uh, that even, even in his uh, most dire moments in 1984, that even so-called rogue states, even so-called tiny terrorist cells would have access to nuclear materials and it possibly be able to just create these bombs themselves. Remember, 
uh, that 1984 is organized into three super states, Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia. In other words, roughly the American empire, Oceania. East Asia, the empire that would form under the People's Republic of China, and Eurasia, which of course would be the USSR dominated Europe, where it would move not only uh, beyond Eastern Europe, but into Western Europe. So he was not imagining uh, little terrorist cells that would uh, be able to drop atom bombs or at least threaten uh, to destabilize all kinds of situations in the world. Uh, to that extent, it's gone beyond the vision of 1984. So I, I, let me just sum it up by saying, uh, ethically, I think it's still eminently relevant. That is, how can we possibly create a world that voluntarily renounces this possibility of destroying ourselves through these weapons? Uh, practically, how all that could even reach consensus in light of the numerous groups, cells that may need to buy in. <laughs> uh, I, I think one is just stymied. If, if you can't deal with places like Washington, Moscow, London, and so on, but you're just dealing with uh, some terrorist group and you don't even know who the spokesman is, uh, because there are just so many sectarian divisions. How do you even proceed? That's what Orwell certainly, there's nothing in, in the essay that could possibly suggest that level of complexity. So thank you, <clears throat> pardon me, thank you, Brooks. Thank you, John. We are nearly to the end of our hour, 2.53 Eastern. Roy, could I call on you? You have a question in chat, but we'd be happy to hear from you if you'd like to give voice to it. Uh, sure, happy to. Uh, and as as context, have three teenagers living through Orwell, right? Doing 1984 and Animal Farm both. And there's just a lot of him bouncing around our house at the moment. <laughs> um, but I just was curious about your comment that uh, about Orwell's influence in, in 89 as a result of 1984. And uh, it's just an interesting perspective of sort of responsibility for an author, right? I mean, you, 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 you effectively are saying, uh, he changed the course of history by by a bit of a, a scare of what could be. And I just found that I had never thought of it in that regard, right? I mean, obviously these, are, especially political fiction are all in the context of the world as it is today or whenever it's published. And it, uh, I don't know, it just, that just struck me as an interesting comment that, that an author has to think of the ramifications <laughs> Of, of the publication, uh, good or bad, in, in either direction. And do you think he did? I mean, was he intentionally uh, trying to change the course of history, shall we say? Well, I suppose every author dreams of having an immense influence. I will say, practically speaking, he thought that uh, there would be no chance that his novel would sell much more than 10,000 copies. That's what he said uh, to his agent was his hope, at least 10,000. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me just put this in a larger context within the aims of my own book, because uh, what I hadn't mentioned was that I'm launching an argument in this book that George Orwell is the most important writer who ever lived. And that is a very large claim. And I mean it to be a provocation more than a carefully developed case. That is to say, uh, he's the most important writer who ever lived. And let me qualify what I mean by that adjective important. He is not the greatest man of letters. He is not even the leading literary figure of the 20th century, or even 
arguably the best novelist of his generation, even in England, where I think he probably would himself concede that it was evil in war. And that aside from four early novels in the 1930s, Orwell did not write another novel. He wrote a best-selling beast fable and an anti-utopia that turned out to be a masterpiece. Neither of them novels in any sense. And yet, by the standard of his influence, of his impact upon the world, with his coinages known in dozens and dozens of languages and even intellects, with his books in every library, in every town in the world, practically bar none, with his very name in adjectival form, receiving millions of hits on the internet, again, in multiple languages. There is nothing comparable and there has never been anything comparable. And as I said, it really is a phenomenon unprecedented. And in another respect, a phenomenon that is rivaled only by Shakespeare himself. That is, everyone knows these coinages, but only a relatively small percentage of those people know even who the author was. I can walk down the street and say Big Brother, and they will think it is a reality TV show that they once tuned into. And if I say, well, where did that phrase come from? They're not quite sure. And if they hit on 1984 and I say, who's the author? Uh, hmm. Uh, and they can't come up with it. Just like all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Um, who said that? <laughs> Et cetera. There was an interesting example of this not long ago that I noticed that um, uh, somebody said that, oh, brave new world and all the people in it, and said, that's a famous line of Shakespeare, which indeed it is. But he was corrected by saying, that's not Shakespeare. That's, that's Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. You don't even know that that's, see, so it's this kind of thing. Now, um, more to the particulars of the question, the, uh, I, I have developed a kind of calculus that I would say seems to apply to literary works that have a political possibility, namely, uh, that they can function like a cultural bomb. And in Orwell's case, a cultural atom bomb. Remember that uh, Animal Farm was published only a week after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that it exploded on the cultural front in World War II with the same kind of power and detonated at the precise moment that the Cold War was being born. So here's the calculus. The greater the throw weight, the less precise the accuracy. So when you say, are you responsible for the misinterpretations, the distortions, the unforeseen disastrous consequences that emerge from your work. Are you responsible that you should have envisioned this and taken it into account by the way in which you wrote the work? When you ask that question, in effect, what you are also asking is, do you reduce the throw weight make the work less powerful, so to speak, and therefore make its targets more accurate. The more accurate something is, 
the less general application it will have, both in the present and in the future. Now, one might say, but look, how could anybody misjudge Animal Farm? It is a political allegory involving one-to-one -one correspondences in the history of the Bolshevik Revolution and the events of the fable with each different character. So Napoleon is Joseph Stalin, Snowball is Leon Trotsky, the building of the windmill is the five-year plan and on and on. But of course, we know that Animal Farm can also be talked about as a satirical vision, a fable that is a moral, a parable of the fate of revolutions in general, that they will betray themselves. And it's not just about the history of Soviet Russia. And so it has been used for revolutions of all sorts, all sorts to condemn them, to condemn even the possibility of revolution. And Mutatis Mutandis, the same with 1984. So was Orwell responsible? Many critics on the left say, yes, he should have been. He should have seen what would have happened, that he had promoted a totalitarian critique of totalitarianism. And what he had condemned by the exaggerated condemnation that he issued would therefore double back and boomerang and that he would be seen not as a critic of the excesses of the left, of the Stalinist left, but as a critic of socialism itself. That is, he would be seen as a cold warrior and as a forerunner of neoconservatism. And this was precisely the argument of Norman Bidharitz in 1984, that if Orwell had been alive today, he would see that this was the logical extension of the work that he had written in 1984. Yes, that it was inevitably that he would have to condemn not just Stalinism, but its aftermath because it was perverted at the core. The evil was not Stalinism. It was the very concept of collectivism, of concentrating economic and political power in one center. And if that were done, then QED, tyranny would result. Now, Podharitz doesn't fault Orwell for that. He says simply, he would agree with me today. So um, my own view is no writer can anticipate the future. And Orwell never could have envisioned his afterlife. No, his afterlife is so unique that nobody could ever have envisioned this kind of second act. And I would even go so far as to say, it is not just unprecedented, but that it cannot be and will never be duplicated. This will never happen again to the extent that, just as an aside, because there's a chapter in my book on this, it is little known that the fame of George Orwell and of 1984 has relatively little to do with either the man or even the book. Now that seems astonishing. What do you possibly mean? I mean this, I can give you a date. I can give you a precise date in history on which George Orwell and 1984 jetted into what I refer to as the status field that is, became a celestial star uh, orbiting that has continued to do so. December 12th, 1954, the BBC TV adaptation of 1984, which had the largest audience to that time, except for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth previous year. And it was rebroadcast just that was on a Thursday, on the following, it was, that was on a Sunday. It was rebroadcast on the following Thursday. In each case, had about 80% of the television sets in Britain at the time. 
So the largest TV audience collectively for any production in history, uh, percentage-wise. That production led to the deaths of people who were watching it on TV, including World War II veterans. There were weeks and months of debate in the Times of London and in other major newspapers and magazines in Britain about it. It led to the formation of another TV channel in Britain. I could go on except to say it went what we would say would be viral. That week, the Times of London editorialized the name Big Brother. John, John I, I'm, I'm so rude on your post. I have to ask you to wrap it up. We're eight minutes over time. Oh, sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. I, I apologize, but we got to wrap up. Could you could you put a bow on this, however you like, but take a minute and we're going to conclude. Uh, 1984 and George Orwell and Big Brother were virtually unknown yesterday, and today they are household words. That was the editorial. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Well, I'm sorry for, for the interruption. Not very elegant of me. But, but thank you all. Again, here's the book, Becoming George Orwell. John, it's a fabulous piece of work. It's a wonderful read. What a fascinating conversation. All of you, for your time, thank you very much. Have a great, safe afternoon, evening, weekend. John, thanks for this hour. Very well spent. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you.